Thank you all for coming to our open meeting. This is probably our 10th or 11th open meeting in Oakland. And as I've told all of you, this is a community space for animal rights and veganism. At our open meetings, we tell you a little bit about direct action everywhere and get some of your ideas. But more recently, in the past couple months, we've also had topics, um, topics where we present on. And the subject for today's talk is effective meme spreading. And so the plan, the plan for the meeting is, I'll do the talk, and then we'll tell you about DXC, show you a few of our actions, and then just have a discussion. And, and you, know, you can give us some feedback about our actions, our organizing principles, give us some ideas for activism, and we might even try and plan something spontaneously today, because we found that that's kind of an effective way to demonstrate what we're about, to actually go through the planning process and kind of show you what we do. So if that sounds good and no one has any questions, I'll just jump right into the talk. Good? Okay. So, the talk today is about effective meme spreading, and I will discuss in a bit what a meme is, if you don't know what a meme is. But the, the plan of the talk is, I, I want to prove to, to you three things. The first point of the talk is that ideas matter. That they matter in, in human behavior, they matter in, in, in development in the course of human civilization, they matter in political science, and economics, and psychology, in all different areas. Ideas matter. And you might think, all right, this is true, but uh, I'll try and suggest to you that this is actually a fairly recent phenomenon in a lot of fields of study, including my own field of study, economics. The second thing I want to demonstrate is that the spread of ideas depends on certain attributes of the ideas. And the three attributes in particular that I want to, that I want to discuss today are the fecundity, fidelity, and longevity of these ideas. And I'm taking these directly from a metaphor that a famous evolutionary biologist, Richard Dawkins, makes to the spread of genes. So, um, memetics is, in a sense, uh, the direct ideological comparison to a field of study in biology called genetics, which I'm sure we're all aware of. And not all genes are equal. Some genes spread more quickly and more powerfully than others. And we'll be using that metaphor throughout the talk to hopefully elucidate some insightful, kind of, at least hypotheses about effective animal activism. So let's just jump into the slots. And if I use terminology that's too arcane or if I'm talking too fast, please just kind of jump in and slow me down or ask me a question. We want this to be a discussion. And all of our meetings are discussions. So um, hopefully it won't just be me talking to you. you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have a little bit of interaction back and forth. But the first point, ideas matter. So there's a famous psychologist by the name of B.F. Skinner, I think taught for most of his career at Harvard, who had this theory of human psychology and behavior that was called behavioralism. And the idea was that human beings, and in fact other animals as well, are black boxes. And we don't actually have to know what's going on inside of them, physiologically, psychologically, emotionally. All we have to do is look at the inputs from their environment that go into this organism, and we can predict deterministically or probabilistically what the outputs are going to be in terms of behavior. And he applied this to everything from language to sex to, to violence, everything. Um, and this actually took hold for many years and was very influential in psychology and sociology and especially in economics for decades. Um, but in the 1950s and 1960s, there were some very intelligent and insightful academics led by one fellow that probably all of us know by the name of Noam Chomsky. He started to challenge this and said, you know what, I'm, I'm not sure this is correct. And I know we like to, as scientists, think that you know, we can control these these studies and experiments very carefully by just looking at the environments and kind of look at the inputs from the environment. But the reality is, I think, from my studies and from my intuition about human behavior and life, that there's something happening inside of our brains that might matter for what, how we actually behave. And so there's a wonderful quote in a review of a book that Skinner put out in the 19, I think it was the 1950s, where he says, one would naturally expect that the prediction of the behavior of a complex organism, or even a machine, would require in addition to information about external stimulation, knowledge of the internal structure of the organism, the ways in which it processes input information and organizes its own behavior. <clears throat> so Chomsky and a number of other cognitive scientists, and Chomsky himself actually was not a trained scientist, or, or not a scientist in the traditional sense, he was a linguist, a cognitive linguist, um, started what's been described in, in many different fields as the cognitive revolution. And the cognitive revolution, revolution is, is, is basically about what the last slide was titled, that ideas matter. In science and in predicting human behavior and even animal behavior, we have to look at how the brains are actually operating, what, what ideas are, are animating those brains. And um, you can see this in many different areas. So 
Uh, before I became an economist, I studied political science at the University of Chicago, and there's a huge debate in political science between a scholar named Kenneth Walt, who in the 1960s and the 1970s came up with a theory called realism. And the theory was basically when we examine behavior, political behavior, and especially the political behavior of large groups, um, we could just consider them a black box, that all states behave more or less identically, and they respond to their environments in similar ways. Um, but in the 1990s and 1980s, there is a new form of scholarship led by a scholar named Alexander Wendt at the University of Chicago called constructivism. Uh, and the idea behind constructivism is state relations, and, and just to give you some context, Ken Walt was what's, what's described as a realist, in that he believed that there are certain elements and certain attributes of the state of nature that force states to always be in conflict. Namely, you're in this constant state of uncertainty. If anyone has read Thomas Hobbes, Thomas for Hobbes is very famous for saying that in the state of nature, it's a war of all against all. Because if I don't know what you're going to do to me, the only thing I can do is preemptively you know, impart violence on you, to stop you from potentially harming me. And Kenneth Wall was in this line of, of thinking. But Alexander went through the What What year was Walt? Walt is, I think he's probably in the 50s or 60s. Right? So he's about the same time as B.F. Skinner, maybe a little bit after. But Wendt came along and said, no, I actually don't think this is the case. I think even when we talk about large groups of individuals, like nation states, um, the state of nature and anarchy is what we make of it. So if, if I see someone coming down the street, my immediate reaction doesn't have to be, he might be dangerous, I'm going to kill him. Because maybe he's waiting. Maybe he has a pond in his hands and he's offering it to me. There's all these little signals that human beings can engage and that can know what their intentions are. And the intentionality of their behavior matters as much as, much as kind of the possible violence they can part of us in determining how I'm going to react to that. So that's one type of in political science. Another is in economics. And in economics, for, for most of the past 60 or 70 years, a school of thought called rational choice theory has dominated, led by scholars like the Nobel Prize winner, Milton Friedman, at the University of Chicago. And the idea behind rational choice is that Human beings are rational optimists. We look at the environment around us, we're always trying to maximize our utility or profit or whatever it is. And we're kind of little calculating machines. But in the 1980s and 1990s, there is a new form of scholarship called behavioral economics, led by all things a psychologist at Princeton named Daniel Kahneman, that challenged us and created a huge body of literature showing that human beings are profoundly inconsistent creatures. And we're also emotional creatures, that a lot of what we do has no self-benefit, has no benefit to someone else. It's just has to do with things like habit, emotion, tradition. And Kahneman himself also won a Nobel Prize in 2000. And now Kahneman has, I think, won the debate in economics as to whether humans are rational or not. Um, and then finally, history. Um, I think probably all of us know of Karl Marx and his famous theory of historical materialism. I mean, historical materialism was basically a theory that said we can look at the kind of physical conditions, the economic conditions of our environment and predict how society, the course of human civilization, and developed. And we don't have to look at the ideologies, the thought patterns, the beliefs, the cultures of, of peoples. What matters is what their economic system is and the material circumstances. Of people. <laughs> oh, um, we still doesn't agree. Um, but Karl Marx has been discredited by a couple hundred years of research now. And historians, economic historians like Douglas North and Robert Fogel, Douglas North, I think, was at Stanford. Robert Fogel was a professor of mine at the University of Chicago have shown empirically that this just isn't true. That there are many circumstances through history where the institutions that we develop, and most importantly, the soft institutions like culture, like trust, like intimacy, matter immensely in what societies develop and how they develop. Um, and I think I mean, the experiment of communism is one example where you know, it obviously didn't go quite as well as, as Karl Marx and some communists would like. Okay, so that's kind of a, a long one there. Um, so ideas matter. Hopefully I've convinced you that ideas matter and that there's a trend in many different fields of scholarship that ideas do matter. But all ideas are not equal. Some ideas replicate and spread and some ideas do not. So, I mean, obviously some people believe in fairy tales. One of our house members is very fond of fairy tales. Most people do not believe the fairy tales and mythologies that we've told each other for hundreds of years. And, you know, but there are other ideas that have spread quite profoundly. Ideas like democracy, justice, and liberty. Um, and Richard Dawkins in a very famous book called The Selfish Gene, which I highly recommend that everyone read, in, in part because I think it's actually very anti-speciesist. He talks a lot about how humans and other animals actually behave in very similar ways and have similar sorts of cognitions. And Dawkins is a very, I would say, a strong supporter of animal liberation, notwithstanding the fact that he himself does eat animals. Which, you know, <laughs> preface that remark, as many people always you know, come up to me after, after talks when I talk, 
when I say good things about Richard Dawkins and tell him, you know he eats animals, <laughs> I totally understand that, and I think he himself even concedes that he shouldn't be done. But Richard Dawkins in this book, uh, which is a beautiful exposition of the theory of evolution and natural selection, which is an, as ironclad a theory as we get <laughs> in science, which is selfish gene. The Selfish Genes is a book. And, um, and most of the book is about natural selection and genes, but he has an important chapter called um, Mimetics, which is about how, uh, I think this is actually the next thing, that for literally billions of years, life on the planet Earth has been dominated by natural selection and competition over genes. But over the past few hundred years, in, in part because human beings are normative creatures, we've arguably moved beyond natural selection toward a new form of selection. And the best way to see this is, the more developed a civilization is in human civilization and human culture, the less likely they are to have uncontrollable birth rates. In countries like Japan and my home country, Taiwan, the birth rate is something like 1.1 to 1.2 per woman, which is far lower than the 2.2 women you need to actually replace the human population. And if human beings are still gene maximizers, then this doesn't make any sense at all. You should be having as many children as you possibly could. And he has a lot of other examples like this in the book, if you'd like to read it. Um, but there's a wonderful quote where he says, we alone on Earth can rebel against the tyranny of our selfish replicators. The selfish replicators are the genes that control our behavior for literally billions of years. And he says that we've now moved on to a new form of selection, where instead of selecting on the basis of genes and how fit those genes are, we're selecting on the basis of ideas. Ideas that might have moral truth to them, that might have internal consistency, that matters to whether they propagate and spread or whether they stay stuck in a gap. And Dawkins says in the book, just as genes propagate themselves in the gene pool by leaping from body to body via sperms or eggs, so memes, and I'll define memes in a second, propagate themselves in the meme pool by leaping from brain to brain in a process which, in the broad, pro in the broad sense, can be called limitation. Is, he, is Richard Dawkins that famous atheist? Yes. yes. He's also a very, very famous atheist. Right. But he, I mean, he became famous initially as you know, an evolutionary biologist. I mean, he might someday win a Nobel Prize. But he's like in that. He's certainly in that level of kind of accomplishment. Um, but what causes replicators to develop and, and spread? And so the, the thought experiment Richard Dawkins offers for both memes and genes in his book is: many billion years ago, when Earth was just a huge primordial soup, there were all these different chemical compounds that mixed and interacted, and, you know, reactions, and you know, why did some reactions continue and happen more often than others? And he comes up with this term that's now a very common term in especially popular descriptions of evolutionary biology and natural selection, the terms of replicators. And the idea is there are certain particles in this primordial soup that replicate, that recreated themselves. And as they replicated, they started to dominate. And some of these replicators became so good at replicating that they formed more complex forms of replicators. And the, the basic unit of replication in, in the natural world is the gene. These, these are basically the molecules that have one, the competition, who have developed techniques for replicating, preventing the replication, preventing kind of other kind of compounds in their environment from stopping their replication, so that they spread all over the planet. And in this primordial soup, Dawkins writes, and evolutionary biologists have found that there are basically three important attributes that cause some genes to replicate more and faster than others. The first and most obvious one is what's called fecundity. And this is just a fancy word for how many times does this replicator actually replicate. So if it replicates more often, then there will be more of a definition of this particular replicator, this particular gene in the universe. But the other two are things that are not as obvious, that also are just as important in, in, in the development of genes, and I'll argue means. The first of, the, of those is fidelity. So if a gene replicates a lot, but it doesn't replicate with any accuracy, then it doesn't actually matter. Right? It's just replicating, creating more random compounds in the hormonal soup. So the question of fidelity is the question of whether the, the gene is replicating with fidelity, with accuracy. And the third and also important attribute is longevity. So in the primordial soup, most of the compounds that develop would quickly be kind of have a reaction to something else and would disappear. So even if something is a very good replicator and replicates with a lot of accuracy, if its, lo if it's longevity is very low, if it's only kind of existing for an instant because it can't defend itself from all the other kind of compounds and organisms in this environment, then it's not actually going to matter whether it's a good replicator. It's longevity so long. So these are kind of the three principles of, of natural selection that I'm going to argue apply just as much to memes. Okay. Um, so I think I forgot to include a slide, but I meant to include a slide on what memes are. Um, and I think I've probably given you kind of a faint sense of what a meme is, but the definition that Dawkins uses in his book and that has been 
be used since then is very simple. A meme is an idea that spreads. Very simple. And so memes are better than others. But meme, in its basic, most basic form, is an idea that can spread. So it can be anything from fashion to ideology um, to a scientific notion like evolution. Evolution itself is a meme. Do you know where the word comes from? Is it like one of those made Dawkins up? Dawkins invented it. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure, well, not 100% sure about that. I'm pretty sure Dawkins invented it. I'm sure he popularized it. I mean, his book was written, I think, 1975, and it's, it's, it's hot now, especially with the internet. But um, it's, and I think it's a hot. It's a pretty new term. It's a pretty new term, but it, it not, not, in, not in sociology and economics as much. I mean, it has been used in some academic research, but it's, it's a new term for you know, popular drug, but it's been around for a while. But it's not like from the Latin. Well, I don't know it sound. I mean, it looks like mine. It's Could be. Mm -hmm. Could be. But it's, I mean, it, I, I'm pretty sure it was coined by Dawkins in 1970, whatever, when he wrote the, the Um So let's, let's talk about each of these. <clears throat> and I'm going to try and apply each of these lessons to memes. And then extend some lessons from memes, from kind of the theory of memes, to how this might affect the messaging that we use. Um, the first attribute every gene has to have, it has, it has to have the inherent drive to replicate. And DNA is a great example of this. DNA in genes, I mean, it's just the nature of DNA that it creates an organism, or sometimes just on its own, um, replicates. It creates more copies of itself. Um, and so when we're dealing with, in the realm of ideas, and we've argued previously, and I think I've, hopefully I've established to you that ideas do matter to some degree, we have to ask ourselves the same question. Does our message, do the ideas we're propagating have the same attribute? Um, at the risk of being antagonistic and kind of rehashing old arguments that I'm fond of having on Facebook, I'm going to use kind of the debate between vegetarianism and liberation, or vegetarianism and activism, as, as, as a way to examine this issue. Because I believe, and I think there's a lot of evidence suggests, that vegetarianism as a meme is not one that replicates very well. And one example is, is Gallup poll that's been done basically, you know, every, I think Gallup does them every five or six years, but in this case we have 1999, 2001, 2000. I would have found better data, but I, I actually made these slides this morning, so I, don't, I didn't have a lot of time to research, so I just pulled what I could find. And um, there are some other polls that have different data. Harris Interactive does a poll for the Vegetarian Resource Group that's a little bit more optimistic. But basically, if you look at any of the polls of vegetarianism over the past, even 200 years, they're all similar to this. So 2012, 5%, 2001, 6%, 1999, 6%. They're all kind of within the, the margin there. Very, very small changes. Um, and there's a lot of literature on this in sociology, and in, um, in psychology. Um, so there's a book that was written by a sociologist named Donna Amar called Vegetarianism, Movement, or Moment. Um, she notes that vegetarianism and outreach has existed in the United States, even just in the United States, as a significant and salient movement for at least the past two centuries. And I, I would add it's existed around the world for, for thousands of years, back to Pythagoras, and the Stoics, and Greek times. There's a lot of discussion in Buddhist and Hindu literature about vegetarianism. So this is this is an idea that has had a lot of time to spread, thousands of years. Um, and in the United States, um, there are basically two moments in our history, according to John Marr, where vegetarianism was at its peak. One was in the mid-1800s, when Seventh-day Adventism came into existence and spread very quickly. And the other was in the 1960s, because of environmentalism and the civil rights movement. Um, and then even back to 1838, I mean, the American Health Convention was advocating vegetarianism as a healthy diet. Um, and John Marr's conclusion is that well, the predominant movement strategies have not successfully attracted more people to adopt a vegetarian identity. And I will say, Don Mar herself is, is not an antagonist to the animal rights movement or, or the vegetarian movement. She is, I believe, vegetarian herself. Um, and there's another quote um, from a, a piece in Psychological Science by a psychologist, I forget his name, I think it's Hal Herzog, where it basically says, the campaign to moralize meeting has failed in the United States. Um, and the campaign he's talking about is you know, this notion that Vegetarianism is not just a diet, but it's also we want to use the diet as a way to, to broach this moral issue of the treatment of animals. And he's saying that can't be a spell. Um, so the, I'm just curious why yeah. where Keith's book is in there. I hate her. Because <laughs> this is an example. I think, I, think we, I think when we frame our message in terms of vegetarianism and consumer change, um, we're setting ourselves up for counter arguments like the other like yeah. yeah. So that's the reason I'm putting it there. I mean, obviously, just so no one gets the wrong idea. I am a very dedicated vegan and have been for a long, long time, for 13 years, and I continue to be, and I still promote it. So that what I'm talking about here is the framing and messaging we use, the content of our message. And I think there, whenever you're looking at any factual scenario, there are a number of perspectives you can apply onto that factual scenario. And what I'm saying is that our interpretation 
of this particular behavior should not be, this is a consumer diet, this is a lifestyle, it should be, this is a liberation. And the reason I'm going to suggest this is because liberation has natural fecundity to it. So, in a liberation movement, I mean, my definition of it is, is that when we believe in liberation, we believe that we have an obligation to see that every animal is given the same safety, happiness, and freedom that we ask for ourselves. So it's not just about me, it's not just about my diet, it's actually about the rest of the world. And it's about what you and you and you and you are doing too, not just what I'm doing. And if you have that sort of normative belief system that's animating the movement, then you can see how those ideas can spread. They have a natural tendency to evangelize. So liberation, and when we describe our movement as a liberation movement, has a drive toward public action rather than just private consumption. And so you might ask, so it creates domino effects in the movement. So it's vegetarianism, typically, when you, when you create one vegetarian, I mean, in my experience at least, you'll create one vegetarian and it stops there. But if you create an animal rights activist, then you can start seeing domino effects that can cascade across an entire network of people. Um, so you might ask, does this work? And I think it's hard to say in the context of the animal rights movement because I don't think it's really been tried that much. We haven't done that much movement building. We focus so much on consumer advocacy and consumer activism that movement building historically has not been a big priority. But we certainly can look at historical models of success or failure in other methods. And I'm going to give three examples. And these are a little bit stylized and you know, there are a lot of critiques you can give of these numbers. So I'm Use these as suggestive and not proof of the concept that I'm trying to impart today. But I can give you a lot more detail on all these three examples because I've researched all three extensively. And I also think that all these movements went through similar shifts in inflection, where for a long time there's a sense in which the movement was raising kind of a moral issue, but it was sort of a what a philosopher would describe as a super derogatory image. It's like something that nice people do, that compassionate people do, but it's not something that I have to push on anyone else. You know, it's just my belief system. I believe that we shouldn't hurt black people, or I believe that women should get the right to vote, but you know, I'm not going to go around and tell everyone else what to do. Right? And in all these movements, there was an inflection point. In the anti-slavery movement, the inflection point was 1832, when the Liberator was first published. And William Lloyd Garrison was a profoundly antagonistic proponent for anti-slavery, and went around castigating slaveholders as murderers and kidnappers. And prior to that, the movement had been focused on just very passive you know, education spread our belief system one by one, convince every slaveholder one by one that you're a good person, you don't want to hurt your slaves, so let them go. And William Lloyd Garrison came along and said, this is a systemic issue, and it matters for everyone. Even if you're just like a passerby, even if you're just someone who's passively buying cotton from a store, this is a societal issue that we all have a responsibility to stop. And um, you can see that from 1832 to 1838, in 1832 there were four anti-slavery societies all over the country. The anti-slavery movement was nowhere. By 1838, 60 years later, there's, and this isn't an incorrect figure, it's actually 45,950% increase in the number of anti-slavery societies around the country, from 4 to 1,348. And, and 30 years later, 30 years after the first issue of The Liberator was published, slavery ended with the Emancipation Proclamation. Okay. Well, very much an oversimplification, a very complicated movement, so I'm, I'm going to move on. But if you have other questions, you can ask me privately, or we can even discuss it at the end of the talk. Civil rights. For basically 100 years after the end of slavery to the civil rights movement, there really wasn't a lot of action happening. And I mean, partly because of the amount of repression that was imparted upon non-white people in this country, there were very few people who were willing to stand up against things like Jim Crow and segregation. And I mean, even the Supreme Court had a famous case called Plessy versus Ferguson that said, you know, separate is equal, and that we don't have to worry about segregation and racism because our institutions are formally supportive of the notion of, of liberation and equality. In 1961, um, there were four activists who decided to perform a sit-in in Greensboro, North Carolina. And at the time, most of their friends and even their fellow activists out there at Percy, um, they sat in at a Woolsworth in North Carolina that was designated for whites. And there was a black waitress who was serving them. And Taylor Branch, the most prominent historian in the civil rights movement, says that the response of the waitress, who was herself black, was that fellows like you, quote, fellows like you make our race look bad. So there was a lot of antagonism towards them, but they felt like they had to make a more strong stand against slavery, and that they had to show that we were one of there had been lots and lots of discussion of Jim Crow. There had been lots and lots of education. There were lots, lots and lots of kind of passive outreach, like be nice to us, be compassionate. Why do we deserve these things? Why do we deserve to be clinched? In 1961, there was a shift in the movement towards more aggressive action. Um, and as you can see, within two years, 1963, there were 100,000 activists participating in sit-ins and other civil disobedience all over the country. By 1964, the Civil Rights Act, which is still, to this day, the most important civil rights legislation that's ever been passed in this country, was passed, which barred all public discrimination. Third example, gay rights. So prior to 1969 and the Stonewall rights, um, there have been many gay organizations. I wouldn't even call them gay rights organizations. 
but the most prominent of these was the Mattachine Society, which focused on kind of building community, which I think is a wonderful thing. Um, but, but basically wanted to kind of expose people to gay ideas and just kind of teach people to be compassionate toward gay people. You know? Notwithstanding the fact that, I mean, I, lack of compassion to me was not the biggest problem. The biggest problem was that people were getting beaten to death, people were being institutionalized, people were being ostracized and tossed out of their families because of who they loved. <clears throat> And um, in 1969, there was a shift in the movement that was triggered by essentially just a mob of queens in New York City. There is a, an inn called the Stone Island in New York City that had been raided multiple times by the New York City police. And every time they raided it, they escorted everyone off to the, uh, to, the, to the jail. And I mean, this is kind of a life-changing event for a lot of people. And people still continued to come back to this inn because they wanted to find you know, people to fall in love with. They wanted to find companions. They wanted to find people who believed the same things they believed. And, and accepted them and respected them as, as living, breathing creatures, as we all want to be accepted and respected. But on this night, for whatever reason, um, there was a riot, and the, the people in the end decided to fight back. And for I think it was three or four days, um, it triggered not just a fight between the police and, and the individuals who were in the inn, but the entire community around them, not the entire community, but a significant portion of the community around them came out and protested and fought and threw rocks at the police. Um, and it created a huge natural controversy. For, for, for decades, if not centuries, the United States has always just thought, you know, homosexuality exists, but it's something that's, you know, we can hide away, we can ignore, because it's these, these disgusting people who are doing these things. Let's put them in prison, we'll put them in mental institutions, we don't have to worry about it, because it's not something we personally have to deal with. And in 1969, that changed. Um, and as you can see, by 1971, there's a 6,000% increase in the number of gay groups nationally, from 50 to 2,500. Um, in part because so many people fell in power. They felt, they read about what happened in the New York Times, we saw that these people were riding in the streets, they're no longer okay, they're just sitting by and accepting things as they were. They were willing to take a stand. And as you can see, by like today, and obviously we're very far from reaching gay liberation, or LGBT, much less LGBT liberation, but still, we've made massive progress and we have multiple states in the news today approving gay marriage. So the point of all this discussion is that in all these cases, these ideas, these more active, energetic, aggressive ideas that encourage people to take action and not just kind of be passive bystanders to violence. Or models for growth, immense growth, exponential growth. <clears throat> so I think the lesson I want all of us to take from this, or I think we should take from this, is that in the realm of memes, if we want our ideas to have fecundity, to be viral, we need to think about three things. One is the idea expressly evangelical. And evangelical is like a terrible term, especially in the circles, but in this context it's a good thing. We want our ideas to have this natural tendency to propagate. And if we have an idea that can go to one person and just stop there, that's a problem. Because that idea is probably going to be, as I'll explain in the next few slides, it's going to deteriorate because there are other social forces that will cause it to erode. So we need our ideas to be evangelical. We need our ideas to have life and energy. Right? And part of what allows them, even if the idea is evangelical, if it's not an idea that can spread, that has appeal to the masses, it's not going to spread. And we can think of action movies, we can think of gossip in the offices, we can think of all the things, all the things that we like to talk about and that create the most energy in our communities. And for my work as a journalist, and I worked at CNN for three months, and was a journalist in college and high school for like seven years, you learned that, I don't even remember where I first heard this, but there are three C's that attract attention. <laughs> and the three C's are controversy, conflict, and change. These are things people like to talk about and they create energy behind the ideas, they create life behind the ideas. And if our ideas and our campaigns are not creating that sort of life, then we need to start revisiting what we're doing. And then finally, the third one is, is our idea true? And truth is kind of, you know, poo-pooed nowadays, especially in leftist circles, because you think, oh, you know, everything's relative, every culture is different. But there's actually an extensive literature in philosophy and psychology that suggests that truth is actually an attribute that allows ideas to spread more rapidly. And the most easy way to see this is in science. Right? I mean, if you have a bad scientific idea, it's just not going to spread very quickly, because people won't be able to replicate the experiment. So, I mean, evolution has spread far and wide, in part because you can do an experiment, and you can look at the data, and you can show that evolution is true. I think the same is true of our ideas. You should try and be honest and, and, and compelling and, and tell what we actually believe is the truth if we want our ideas to spread viral. Okay, so let's move to the second principle of memetics that I think is important, and that is fidelity. So genes are natural replicators but they're also accurate replicators. And one of the amazing things about DNA is in this huge primordial soup where all these things are reacting with all these other things, DNA not only has the ability to replicate, but it has the ability to replicate in a very, very accurate way. I mean, there's still errors, which is why we have mutation and evolution. 
but for the most part, DNA is this amazing innovation that nature came up with. Um, and the same is true of memes. If we want memes that are going to spread and spread in all the world in a way that's robust, we need them to be accurate replicators. If an idea does not maintain its integrity in the face of erosive forces, it will not spread. And uh, I, this picture is kind of a game of telephone, and so we've all had this happen to us, whether it's gossip in some social circle, in the workplace, or you know, even just playing a game of telephone. You can see when an idea goes from one person to the next, it usually shapes and evolves itself. So we need ideas that can maintain their integrity. So how do we do it? Well, the first thing I want to point out, and <laughs> I'm going to go back to vegetarian bashing, I apologize, but it's, uh, it's a habit of mine, but maybe I should get rid of it. But, um, is that there's actually already research on whether vegetarianism itself, cons cons consumer activism, is an idea that has much fidelity. And there's a study, and actually there are quite a few studies that show, and I'm just going to read this. The reason for the widespread and mistaken belief that America is rapidly going veg is the mismatch between what people say they eat and what they actually eat. Take a 2002 Times CNN poll on the eating habits of 10,000 Americans. Six percent of the individuals surveyed said they considered themselves vegetarian. When asked by pollsters what they had eaten in the last 24 hours, 60% of the self declared vegetarians admitted that they had consumed red meat, poultry, or feed fish the previous day. In another survey, the United States Department of Agriculture randomly telephoned 13,313 Americans, very large samples here. 3% of the respondents answered yes to the question, do you consider yourself to be vegetarian? A week later, the researchers called the participants again, and this time asked what they had eaten the day before. The results were even more drastic than the time to answer. This time, 66% of the vegetarians eat, had eaten animal flesh in the last 24 hours. This is drawn from an economic study that actually has nothing to do with vegetarians and animals at all. It has to do with surveys and the use of surveys in, in um, sociological and social scientific research. And that's a whole other can of worms. But the point I want to make here is that there are a lot of ideas that can spread but don't actually kind of have much fidelity. They don't actually, they don't have the stickiness that we like. So, you know, you may be vegan and you spread an idea of veganism to the next person. But their concept of veganism might be watered down. And when they spread it to someone else, even if they do spread it to someone else, it might be watered down even more. And there are reasons for this that I'm going to try and explain. Um, so the first thing to ask is if people are going back from eating, you know, plant-based to eating animals, what are the reasons? And again, there's research on this question. Uh, this is from a study called Motivation for Meat Consumption Among Ice Vegetarians, which was done fairly recently in 2009. I think it's by the same individual, Hal Herzog, who's I think is a social psychologist or a psychologist. Or, or, or he's a sociologist. I think he's a clinical psychologist. He does research. Why do we eat animals or something like that? He's, he's written a lot in this sphere. He's one of the people who's done a lot of research. And if you look at the data, um, the vast majority of people who are, who are quitting vegetarianism are quitting for reasons unrelated to ethics. They're quitting because it's unhealthy, because it's a hassle, um, because they have cravings for social reasons. Ethics is at the bottom of the chart. Oh, how could you, what does that even mean to say I'm putting vegetarianism because of ethical reasons? I think because they, they no they've given up their ethical reasons. Yes. Okay. So, and, <laughs> and also because, I mean, it's, I mean, to me this is at least suggestive as to why they were vegetarian in the first place. Right? Because if you went vegetarian for ethical reasons and you wouldn't cite health probably, yeah. why are you giving up? Because, I mean, not always, but usually the reasons you do something are also the reasons you stop doing something. Okay. Um, so, I'm going to kind of uh, go back to the comparison to genes briefly and say that when we see this sort of erosion in memes and the fidelity of meme transmission, we shouldn't be that surprised because we see the same pro problems in the transmission of genes. Um, so genes, as I said, are, are living in a very hostile environment. There's all these other chemical compounds that are trying to interact with them, they're trying to pick off certain molecules. Um, and there's damage that's done. But the key thing is that genes and DNA, in particular as a molecule, has a pretty ingenious mechanism for preventing this sort of erosion ensuring the fidelity of not only the kind of template, but the spreading, the genes that are created. And so the double helix template, I mean, if you all remember from like high school biology, the way it works is you know, the double helix sort of unravels, and it has a very explicit template, you know, step by step. Every single one of these nucleotides is lined up against the template. And that's, that's a wonderful way of replicating it. It ensures that the replication is going to be very accurate, you know, point by point through every single, every single kind of nucleotide. Um, they've also created there are genes that are related to other genes and genes that are explicitly devoted to nucleotide repair. So our DNA, even when it's damaged, our body has mechanisms, so there are genes in our body. There are genes in our body that are actually focused on repairing those. And with, with a double helix template, I mean, you can actually repair them fairly easily. You can just go down the, the template, you have these you know, 
proteins that will go down the template and figure out, all right, you know, there's a defect here. Something's happened. This nucleotide has been replaced. We need to fix this. And then finally is the last resort. And I don't actually like this comparison too much to the medics because it sounds kind of violent. They're T cells. So sometimes when a cell or a nucleus goes just off the rails, like with cancer or some virus, um, it's flagged by the organism as a problematic cell. And the T cell swoops in, and there are these T cells called natural killer cells that come in and just swallow them. It's there, and you're gone. You know? And this is, these are the ways that kind of DNA maintains its integrity. But the point I want to make, and I think the metaphor that even Richard Dawkins makes in his book, is that successful ideas, and idea, and especially successful structural normative ideas, institutions, like, so when we talk about ideas, we don't mean just an idea in one person's head. We're talking about an entire system of ideas in many people's heads. What causes that system of ideas to flourish is that it has, in part because, it has the same sort of repair and feedback mechanisms that reinforce the integrity of those ideas. Um, and so there's this wonderful example that Krasakis and Fowler, who are these really, really amazing um, sociologists, and uh, Krasakis is actually a medical doctor as well, he's a joint MG, M or MD and PhD, he's at Harvard Medical School, is, and they've done a lot of research in the transmission of all sorts of crazy ideas, from smoking to happiness to obesity, and shown that all these ideas and the behaviors associated with those ideas spread through social networks like a virus. You can look at these the way he does as an epidemiologist. You just look at kind of the map and say, like, oh, well, this is just like the flu or you know, like SARS or you know, like AIDS, hey, some sexually transmitted disease. One of the interesting insights that Krasakis makes in a recent book is that if you're really convinced that you need to try and um, spread an idea very quickly, and if you're worried about erosion because it's a very majoritarian idea, one of the things you actually have to do, let's assume that this person is the one spreading the ideas, and this is these are all the individuals he's directly related to, or she's directly related to. And these are the individuals that are related to the person that they're directly related to. One of the points that Krasakis makes is that if you're worried about fidelity and erosion of belief systems, getting this, getting this portion of your network is actually less important than this portion. <laughs> because if you get this portion, then the outer layer will eventually erode them and cause them to go back to whatever belief system they probably have. But if you have this portion, then you have kind of a layered system. And your advocacy towards the people immediately around you will be improved immensely if all their friends, if, if your friends all have friends who are animal liberationists or vegan, mm -hmm. they're much more likely to become vegan, and more importantly, more, like, more likely to stick to it, because their social network is, they're now embedded in the network of activists. Right? And again, this is why it's important. When, when we talked about fecundity and the idea that we need to create ideas that don't just go one, one, one degree of separation away, but also two degrees of separation away. One reason is because it's always better to have more activists, right? and, it's, and that's kind of the point of our entire movement. But it's just important to note that if we actually want to convince even the people we directly convince and make sure they stay convinced, those ideas need to be able to spread to the second degree and the third degree and fourth, fourth degree of separation, or they will erupt. And this is kind of one of the insights that Krasakis makes about smoking. Like if you're trying to convince someone to stop smoking, don't just convince, don't, don't just, don't just convince them, convince all their friends. Because if their friends are still smoking, they're going to smoke. And the same is triple piece, for example. If, they're all, if their friends are eating poorly, one push you can take is to try and convince your friends. The other approach is make sure they're embedded in social networks where they're surrounded by people who are eating healthy, and they're likely to eat healthy too. Okay. So, summing up, what are attributes of fidelity that we need to focus on in our messaging and activism to ensure that our, our activism has high fidelity? Um, I think the first thing is our ideas have to have high clarity and contrast. Right? If we can't distinguish our ideas from all the other ideas that are out in the soup, right? there's all these other ideas that are propagating out there then it's not going to have any fidelity. And this is one of the things, I mean, DNA has, DNA is very, very clear. Right? It has a template that's clear and it's distinct from everything else out there in the primordial suit. It tells you this is what we're going to do. We're just going to line this up, all the nucleotides are going to be lined up. And it's because of that clarity and specificity, because of how exact it is, and how direct it is, that it's effective. And the second is, we have to have feedback and repair mechanisms. And what are the feedback and repair mechanisms in, in activism? Well, I've already mentioned one, community reinforcement. If you have social networks and embedded social networks, your ideas are more, much more, more, more likely to stick. Um, and the other is we should have kind of subsidiary norms. So one of our norms should be animal liberation, but another one of our norms should be that it's important for us to kind of regulate animal liberation. I mean, obviously, you know, there's a lot of jokes about the vegan police and whether we should have the vegan police. And I, <laughs> I'm actually very sympathetic to the notion we shouldn't be vegan policing because I don't, I'm not that interested in consumer behavior. But we should be policing ideas. And, and policing isn't even the right word. The, the notion, because I think. The, the important notion isn't that we should be policing, it's that when we see an idea that we think is correct, we should be willing to say something. Right? That is kind of the corruptive mechanism that DNA has. But too often in this movement, I think we're told, oh, no, no, you shouldn't push people. You, know, you can't say what you think. Be careful what you say, because you'll antagonize people. But the reality is, if we want to make sure that our ideas are actually maintaining their integrity, we sometimes do have to speak up. 
and I'd say much more often than currently. Okay. So the last one, which is also going to be the shortest one. Um, oh, and the reason, um, so I have the reason I have this picture is just community. You know, so. It should have been all this. Yeah. I, I picked all these pictures, but I don't think I've actually been describing them. Um, okay, so the last attribute is longevity. So again, if you recall, we said that genes propagate because they're natural replicators, and they have this natural desire to spread and spread and spread. They replicate because they replicate accurately, and you know, so they're spreading, but they're also spreading the same version as the original had. Um, but again, longevity is just important. Um, if, if, this, if whatever the unit is that's spreading is not spreading very long, it doesn't matter how much it's spreading or how accurate it's, spread, it's, it's, it's replication is, because it's just not around very um, and so, in the context of biology, I mean, there are kind of two things here. One is just how long lived is DNA itself? Like, how long did it withstand the pressures of the environment and continue to replicate? But more importantly, from the evolutionary perspective, is how long lived the organisms on there? The organisms need to be that survive. So, um, you know, in, in the primordial soup, so as I see, in the primordial soup, even a few minutes of survival is actually pretty impressive for a complex molecule. In the complex molecules that did develop defense mechanisms and had the ability to kind of survive and keep replicating for a long period of time, the ones that spread all over the planet. Okay. So I don't have any data for this, and like I said, I just put these slides together this morning, so I'm sure there is data. I've seen it, but I didn't I can supply it to you today. But um, certainly in my personal experience, and I'll try to supply data to anyone who is interested in that. The typical active is life in the animal rights is weeks. It's not measured in in months or years, it's measured in weeks. You might see people come to one demonstration or a couple of leafleting events and they disappear and you never hear them. Um, so that's that's a problem. If we care about spreading ideas and our, our, our units of spreading are not sticking around very long, um, it's something we need to correct. And again, this is sort of anecdotal too, but I think probably uncontroversial that most people have been around activism and activist circles for a long time, and I've, I've been an activist now for basically the past 14 years, since 1999, for at least six or seven, broadly speaking, large social justice movements, I've been anti-capital punishment work in Chicago, LGBT work, anti-racism work, um, and these, these are common strands in all these activists. Why did people burn out? Why did they? Why did they not have more job? Um, the first is honestly, it's there's some activist movements that don't actually ask for much of an initial in in commitment. So it's just the way they're, they're framed and the way they describe the movement to other people is that it's kind of this fun hobby thing. So um, typically, when I did dog and cat rescue work in Chicago, um, we didn't have any kind of inspirational grand goals. It's just like, oh, come walk dogs. It's fun. I'm like, about the dogs. And so typically, I mean, honestly, I think the the, the, the modal activist probably came one time. <laughs> So, and not even because they didn't believe it, and I'm sure they love walking dogs and cats and, and, and adopting animals out, it's just, they didn't see it as a big deal. It's just, you know, oh, you know like someone else can do this. It's, 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 of course it's bad if dogs not getting walked, but it's not the hugest deal. So one problem with our movement is I think sometimes our initial framing is not ambitious enough. Um, we call it a hobby rather than a call. The second is that there's a huge amount of pessimism about effectiveness, um, whether the movement as a whole, which I think is actually the bigger problem, or specific tactics, which is also a problem. And so there, there's maybe not a lot we can do about pessimism about specific tactics, because all of us have different factual beliefs about what tactics work, and if someone just doesn't believe that the, the set of tactics that I'm using or someone else is using is something that they're, they're optimistic about, then you know obviously they're not going to continue doing it. But maybe they'll find something else, which is great. The bigger, form of the bigger and more problematic form of pessimism is pessimism about the movement. Because if you have pessimism about the movement, then you won't just jump from one group to the other. You'll just stop doing actives entirely. <laughs> which I think is, is the hugest problem that we're facing as a movement. Um, the third is that there are some people who don't even have any particular reasons related to the movement. They're just pulled towards other social networks. And I think all of us who've done any university organizing have certainly seen this, where I was part of, I think it was, I think it was the largest RSO by membership at the University of Chicago in terms of the number of people, the vegan society there. Um, we won awards, I think, two out of the three years that I was involved in that RSO as the best RSO on campus. And we had, you know, hundreds, sometimes even thousands of people come out to our events. We had prominent speakers like Dennis Kucinich, Howard Lyman come. We, we did Try Vegan Week every year where we gave hundreds of people on campus access to vegan foods and, and asked them to commit to veganism for an entire week, everything from breakfast to lunch and dessert. Um, and yet, like 10 years, or actually, 10, 12 years later, when I meet people from these groups, my default now is to expect them not to be vegan, much less activists. Um, and part of that is because you see them being pulled towards other social networks. And, you know, some people go to banking, they go to law, and I think most of them still on some level believe the same ideas, but they just don't see them as, as, as important as they once did, which is a problem for the movement, because we need to be able to sustain people in the long run if we want these ideas to survive. 
Um, and the reason I put this picture on is, I think, it's, to me, it's not even so much that some people are better than others. I think it's, all of us are wearing very different hats in different contexts. And the key thing for us is, I think, we have to make sure the animal liberation path is a significant one for them. And they have community support, and they have, um, they, they have a sense that this is a hat that I can wear for a long time, that I like a lot, and that I will stick with. Okay. So, um, just responding directly to those three causes of burnout that I've identified, and I mean, there are certainly others, and we can discuss other possible causes of burnout. But to me, you know, we have to ask ourselves, does, if we, if we want to create ideas and communities and activist networks that have longevity, we have to ask, do our ideas have long-term commitments? Do they inspire people? Do they make people feel like this is something I could devote my life to? Not just five minutes, not just 10 minutes, not even five weeks, but can I spend my, this is something that's important enough for me to devote a life to. Second is, does our idea have positive and constructive, does it have a positive and constructive policy? Is it, is it constantly about what we can achieve and what we can hope for and, and the progress that we're making? I mean, obviously, you don't want to be delusional and start you know, identifying successes and unexpected actual successes, but in general, I mean, it, any of us who've worked in groups know that sometimes we're in groups where everyone is very pessimistic and negative and doubtful, and those groups tend not to succeed and people tend not to want to stick around. For good reason, because if you're pessimistic about your probability of success, why would you continue working? And the third is, does the idea reinforce this, a strong community? Right? If, if we're worried about social networks pulling people away from animal liberation and veganism and animal rights, then one of the things we should have in our ideas is this natural network of an embedded community and identity that people can stick to for a long time. So, wrapping up, um, and I mean, we could talk about honestly any one of these bullet points. We, we could have another presentation. We could have another ten presentations about any number, one, any one of these bullet points. So this is a very kind of sky-level summary that has a lot of nuances, both factual and logical, that we can discuss today or at some other occasion. But um, there are three principles to the spread of ideas that I think are very important just to keep in mind when, when we're doing our activism. First is fecundity. And in fecundity, we can break it down into three points. One, are our ideas evangelical? Do they have a natural tendency to spread? Do they have life and energy? Do they create controversy, conflict, or change that will naturally appeal to people and cause people to want to spread those ideas? And third, is the idea truth? Is the idea true? And if you want to find a study on this, there's a paper by a Stanford philosopher named Joshua Cohen called The Ark of the Moral Universe. It's a wonderful paper that I highly suggest you read that talks about how the truth or justice of an idea can cause it to spread and not spread. The second big umbrella um, in terms of the spread of memes and ideas is fidelity. Does the idea have natural clarity and contrast so that people, when the idea is spreading, can actually identify you know, what it is that I need to spread? Or is it muddy? Is it, is it murky? Is it evasive? Is it something that I can't even identify with points? Um, and also, does the idea have feedback and recurrence? So when there is some kind of lack of integrity or corruption of the idea, is there something that kind of can naturally come in and fix and correct it and ensure that whatever is being spread is actually accurate? And finally, longevity. Does the idea inspire long-term commitments? Is this something that's creating units for replication that are replicating for a long period of their life? Does the idea have positive and constructive postures? So is it something that's inspiring people and making people feel fired up, creating more energy rather than less in the movement? And finally, does the idea reinforce a strong community? Does it create, because human beings are social animals. If there's no community for us to station ourselves in, and we can think of each of our social identities as almost a separate organism. And for an organism to survive, there has to be an ecosystem that supports it. And in this case, the ecosystem that supports activism is the activist community. So if we're not creating a strong community, if the ideas we're spreading are not creating communities, then it's probably going to be a problem. Um, so that's it. And so I think uh, if anyone has any questions, we can talk about that. Otherwise, we can jump in with, uh, Kind of um, some stuff that DXA is done, including a video that edit, Lisa edited just a couple days ago, or yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Any thoughts, questions, criticisms, condemnations? No, no, I just have a question. So I'm trying to think of other groups that might consciously or unconsciously be using methods yep. to spread their message, whatever it is. Yep. And the only one that I can come up with is PETA. PETA does. And but right. I, I'm wondering, you know, what, how effective that is in terms of this, or ineffective. PETA, PETA certainly does use a lot of these right. ideas. I don't think explicitly. I mean, Ingrid right. Baker is not a trained social scientist, right. probably a scientist, but she's caught on something. Yeah. Right. And it's one of the reasons PETA has grown. I mean, she she understands the power of controversy. Right. 
Yes. And if anything, I think she understands it a little too well. Because <laughs> to me, there's, I mean, this is one of these nuances, right? That there's controversy that distracts. You don't want controversy for its own sake. And mm -hmm. I think the way I, I the way I'd evaluate Peter is they're really great about fecundity. Mm -hmm. They're not so great about fidelity a little bit. <laughs> right? But, so if you have a naked woman advertising, or if you have, you know, like somebody gets murdered in the news and exploited, or you know, there's some like Trayvon Martin, or you know, there's this episode where there is unfortunately a Chinese man who went insane on a bus and like killed two people on the bus and chopped their head off and started eating their flesh. And everyone was this is in Canada. Did you guys hear about this? When was five this? Or six years ago. Was it? It's like five or six years ago. And it was a horrible incident that everyone was in the world was terrified by. And it was just like, oh my god, this cannibal just like he went insane and started eating people and just chopped. It was just his neighbor. They stabbed him. Everyone on the bus ran out. They locked the bus, tracked him in there, and they had to watch while he was like holding their bodies up to the windows and eating. And he is saying I don't know. He just I think he had a knife, he was just chewing off the flesh. And this is a fairly young man, he was like in his thirties and like I said, unfortunately he's Asian, which maybe I shouldn't be that worried about, it, but he was. Um, so you know, this is this is a traumatic incident for the entire nation. And PETA tried to leapfrog on this and had all these incidents, like all these advertisements that said, you know, like they tried to compare what happened here to there. And, I mean it was incredibly insensitive to the families, because the families were just suffering immensely and, and they, they made it into a joke. You know, they like said like, you know, I think they had some sort of mock advertisement that said like join him, you know, join whatever the guy's name is, and then you know had like similar imagery with like an animal. Um, and it created, it did create a lot of attention. People talked about what Peter was doing, but they didn't talk at all about animals. They talked instead about how much you know, a prick angered Newkirk was, and how you know animal rights activists were insensitive to human suffering, and like there are these families that are horribly traumatized and what happened. I mean, it's hard to even imagine like having a loved one like die that way. But I, I think, I mean, at the same time. I mean, Billions of animals die that way every year. So I, I understand Peter's motivation for wanting to do that, but their method of doing it was just, I think, a little tactless. And um, I will say, though, I think I do think ethically I have huge problems with Peter, but I do think they're one of the most effective animal rights groups, notwithstanding my huge ethical objections, because Ingrid Newkirk understands the importance of creative flair and the importance of drama. Like she's she's a storyteller, and there are very few animal rights groups that focus on storytelling. And ultimately. I mean, I, I had another talk where I talked about the importance of campaigns, but you really could have renamed that talk, The Importance of Stories. And PETA understands the value of stories. And one of the things you need in stories is, is contrast and tension. I mean, if there's no tension, the story's boring. So, I don't know, some people may have other thoughts on PETA, positive or negative. I, I do have very close friends who work for PETA. Um, but at the same time, I've also been arrested in a demonstration against PETA, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, I'm, I have like a lot of, Love hate relationship with that group. I don't think you need her yourself. You know, I think she's in many ways a beautiful person, but it's not, it's not so much. Go ahead. I think there's a place for that kind of um, extremely controversial or just kind of. I mean, it, yeah, I think that the example you gave was pretty mortifying that they use that kind of ad. But some of the other stuff that I've seen people criticize them on doesn't really seem that. It just seems controversial if you choose to make it um, a big deal. And I just think that most people who try to pick on PETA, you know, they like to have some kind of scapegoat yeah. in the beginning movement. And um, I think it's good that there are some players in the beginning that aren't just pushovers, you know. I mean, that very clearly not yeah. intending to be push, not pushover. So yeah, and in terms of certainly in terms of high contrast, <laughs> yeah. in terms of drama, and controversy, you know, and, and the virality of their messages, you know, they spread all over the world. So there, there's a lot they're doing that's effective. You know, the question is kind of. I mean, I think every group, including us, should always be revisiting whether. Just because you're effective doesn't mean you couldn't be more effective if you fix certain problems you have. I do think there's certain problems that you have that, that could be fixed. But then again, so do we. You know, we have problems that, and so do I, personally. So. I have another question. I'm wondering if you had any timeline for the women's movement, similar to the timeline to slavery and civil rights? And I, I do, but it's, it's more qualitative. I, I've never found any good numbers. But you certainly can look, I mean, Emily Pankhurst is one of my heroes. 
and she is and she was named as one of the most influential people in the century by Time Magazine. Um, it's probably more responsible for the women's rights movement than any person, honestly, in the history of human civilization. <laughs> and uh, the approach she took was dramatic is an understatement. <laughs> but she tried to commit arson in Parliament. She was fond of breaking windows of establishments that sort of discriminated against women or didn't support women's suffrage. Um, and she, I mean, she wasn't violent, but she. She definitely was provocative, and she, she wanted to instill that same sort of strength in, in all of her fellow activists. Um, she wanted to convince all, all the women who were fighting for women's suffrage that we all should be out there breaking the and we should all should. I mean, and I don't mean, like that particular tactic I'm not particularly fond of, and maybe, maybe it was very effective in that movement, I don't know, I don't, and I haven't seen a good examination of it, but I'm personally, I'm not ethically against property destruction at all. I, I'm not convinced that it's the most effective thing to do, but I do think the sort of fortitude and strength and courage it took for her to do those sorts of things and end up in jail and prison multiple times is a sort of fortitude and strength that's needed for a movement to grow. But the point is, there is qualitative evidence. I mean, Emily Pankhurst was successful. Yeah. Her movement was do you know successful. What years? This is the early 20th century. So, how many years after she was doing that kind of activism did women get the right to vote? Uh, ballpark, it's like 20. 20. Okay. So, it's the same. Yeah, and there's. The, the key inflection point in, in the women's rights movement is the founding of the Women's Political and Social Union, the, the theme of which, the motto of which, was deeds, not words. Mm -hmm. And then we're done talking. It's time for us to take action. Um, in that case, it was you know, direct action. And, and direct action not in the Gandhian or Martin Luther King sense, but, I mean... Chain themselves to... Yeah, lots of civil disobedience, but also things like, I mean, criminal mm -hmm. you know, So And can you think of any other animal rights movement? Like the ALF or maybe the ELF who are doing direct action like this? That See, I, I don't even know that the ALF or ELF are doing direct actions like this. I mean, their focus is very much on property destruction and economic damage to the industry. And rescue. And rescue, too. But but it's, it's not with the ALF. I mean, they do have the press office. And I think, to me, that's a very important part of those actions. If you don't have the press office, I mean, right. you're not changing anything. Not even, I mean, I guess. If you're doing rescues, it's always influential and important for those individuals who are rescued. So right. that, that is absolutely valuable. Mm -hmm. In terms of property destruction, I mean, if you just if you burn down a slaughterhouse and no one knows about it, it doesn't matter. I mean, someone can just construct a new one or just get sent to Mexico or whatever. I mean, so, um, but the focus is, the theory there is, I mean, I think there are a lot of people in the animal rights movement who have not, I'm going to phrase this in a way that doesn't seem too critical, but are still kind of stuck in a Marxian way of thinking. And, and I don't mean Marxian in terms of morals and politics, because I'm actually sort of a Marxian myself in that sense. Like I believe in total equality, and I think I'd love to have a system of community property where we don't have private property at all. And I used to be a social story guy, I mean Marxian in terms of their academic analysis. I mean, Marx believed in historical materialism. No one believes in historical materialism. No one believes that economics and economic damage alone changes institutions. Right? And this is the point of like the first couple slides, that ideas have a life of their own, and are independent and quite important causal variables in the course of human civilization. Um, and Marx, Marx's theories have discredited, but yet there's still a lot of animal rights activists who think, oh, if we damage the animal industry, if we shut down one slaughterhouse, if we shut down one pharmaceutical company, then we'll just kind of slide down the slippery slope to animal liberation. And I just think there's abundant evidence, not just in our movement, but in other movements, that that's not the case. That we have to have a broader shift in cultural norms to sustain that sort of change. Otherwise, it's easy for society to progress. So, are there any other? Animal rights movement. Uh, I think 269 Life does this. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. I think it, I think 269 Life, and they're very controversial, but their their approach is very much we need to change the culture. We're going to attack speciesism in mean, all of our actions. I mean, and they're all about using social media. I mean, even their initial action, the branding action. I mean, I don't I don't know that they've studied this. I think Sasha has, and Sasha is very kind of kind of the person who founded the organization is is very. I mean, he's he's a smart guy. He's thought a lot about these issues. Maybe not in the same kind of scientific way that I have it, because he's not doesn't have the same background that I have, but he certainly he's done a lot of activism over the years and has kind of independently come to the same conclusions about a lot of these things. I think they do that sort of thing a lot. And it's and it's one of the reasons why they're the biggest grassroots animal rights platform in the world right now. I mean they have I think they make a lot of mistakes too, but then again like I said, so we so so I'm not gonna you know. So would you say civil disobedience is probably the key Action. I don't know if there is a specific key tactic. Um, I do think that there, there, 
I think having a direct and strong and confident message is very important. And that can be done many ways. I mean, that can be done, civil disobedience is naturally kind of strong, right? I mean, you're, you're sacrificing your own freedom and your own physical safety for the sake of some victim. That's intrinsically a powerful and strong message that's viral. It has drama, it has tension, it has a lot of these adjectives. It's fecundity, fidelity, and you know, joke. But, um, but even something as simple as a personal conversation. I mean, honestly, one of the most powerful effects of civil disobedience is that it creates media attention that gives other people in their local communities an opportunity to talk about an issue in a more forceful way. You know, like especially if it's someone who's your friend. And I mean, I know a lot of my friends have told me that some of the stuff that I've done that you know might seem crazy or dramatic or provocative has has given them an opportunity to talk to their friends because they can say, you know what, like Wayne was like doing that crazy thing at Stanford where all those people yelled and screamed at him and called the cops. But you know, I understand why he did it. So I. Mean, you may judge him, and maybe I don't even like exactly what he did, but you know we're talking about it now, and I want to tell you how I feel about it, and I want to tell you why I, I feel like what he did might be okay. And, and the best example of this is I have, I have a friend who's very conservative and, and Mormon, who I really never even talked to about him once. He just knows that I'm vegan, and the reason I know him is because we went to the same law school and built a frisbee together. And like, his knowledge of me is basically I'm just like this quirky vegan kid who loves playing ultimate frisbee, and otherwise, and it's really nice with kids and nice old Mormons, and, and I kind of developed this love for the Mormon community and playing frisbee with them. But they, they're all, I mean, they're all very conservative on many different issues. And I had, he came, he came to the barium once, and, and we had lunch. And he told me he'd seen the Stanford action on my Facebook, and I was like, oh, I, just did, I was like, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> but it was interesting. It like triggered. He told me like, no, I watched it like a bunch of times. And yeah, I did initially think you were crazy, but. At one moment in this, so the Stanford action is this disruption we did, uh, a documentary screening at Stanford where we all got in and kind of blockaged the speakers, because it was, I mean, they were presenting a movie called American Meat, which is a pro-farmer pro documentary about animal agriculture that was partly financed by Chipotle, a huge multinational corporation. And Stanford invited all these speakers are going to have a discussion of it, but they weren't really addressing the animal rights perspective at all. And so it felt like, well, we want to tell them the story. And we did that. Uh, and in a very forceful way. So, and um, you know the crowd was very upset at us, and you know they're, they're like screaming about calling security in place. They didn't ultimately. No, actually they did call police, but no one was arrested, which is good. Uh, well, I mean sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. In this case, I think it was good. But he, he said he saw this this disruption and saw me like get in front because the way it worked was it's, it's actually I I still think the the action was kind of genius in terms of just the theatrics of it because we had one person stand up and like start asking a question and suddenly it turned into a disruption where this was me. I went up to the front and had a picture of an animal moving forward to me and just said. My concluding line was, this is Lisa, and I have a picture of Lisa. She doesn't deserve to die, but neither did any of that. And I, went, and I pointed at the, you know, the people who used this move. And everyone just thinks it's like one crazy person, and they're like, get out of here. And then we had all these people popping up from all different parts of the crowd that were stationed ahead of time. They were like covert agents. And they had similar images, and each of them yelled out to the crowd, you know, this is Chaya, this is Bernie, this is whoever. You know, some animal women, important individuals, and then she doesn't deserve to die, but neither did they. And we all just kind of walk in. So, um, but my friend watched this and he said, like, yeah, initially I thought you were crazy, but there's a point where like a light bulb went off in my head and I realized what your movement is about, despite not really having much exposure to it. And that was a point. And this is interesting to me because I actually sort of regretted these words, but there's a point in the doc in the, in the documentary in, in the video where I say, you know, he's saying the, the director's saying, let's just all have a pleasant conversation about this, let's just sit down and talk. And I interrupted him and I said, Are we gonna have a pleasant conversation about rape? Are we gonna have was a conversation about child pornography, about dog fighting. Are you going to invite dog fighters, give them the form of Stanford to talk about how much they love torturing and killing dogs? And it was that point that I said where he's like, like, oh, I get it now. You know, I get like why he's doing this and why he feels like he needs to do all these things and why so many people feel the need to do all these things. And more importantly than that, like after after that point, he showed that same video to all his Mormon friends in the community, and they ended up having this long discussion. And well, he's a very influential Mormon in this community because he's. Like a corporate lawyer at Adobe, at the University of Chicago Law School, very smart, very just loving person. He's just one of the best people I've ever met. Just very charismatic. And he started this long conversation with this, within his community about animal welfare. Now, obviously, they didn't go all the way to animal rights, so with fidelity, you know, this wasn't an ideal mean transmission. But still, it started a conversation in a community that you wouldn't expect. And part of it was because it was dramatic and confrontational. And um, I don't even remember how I started down that path. Remember? Oh, the best form of being civil disobedience. Sure. Yeah. So I, I the, the reason I started down that path was I think you know, civil disobedience has that attribute where it, it's able to balance because of just how dramatic it is, how tense it is. It's
it's able to balance beyond kind of the low hanging fruit. I mean, I think the animal rights movement is so focused on like you know college undergraduates, and usually they do demographic the profile, and they say like, oh, you know, they're female, they're environmentalists already. Like, it's just we're so focused on low hanging fruit that we don't have a model for systemic change. Like, and I don't care if a handful of college students are vegetarian. I care where the animals are being killed and suffering. And to change that, we need to change the system. And um, civil disobedience is one way to do that. Any other thoughts, questions? It's up to video. It's up to video? Okay. Yeah, that's good. So we could probably turn the camera off. <laughs>